Today's date is Tuesday, June 13th, and want to go ahead and just read the legal notice. I'm Sherry Weiner, Chair of the Board of Fair Commissioners. As information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metro Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. So we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order and I will ask for um, an approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. And you have those in front of you. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion, any corrections or additions to the minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. Commissioner Owens? Approve. Commissioner Hartley? Aye. Commissioner Guarte? Aye. And I am an aye, and so the motion passes. We will now move to public comment time, and I just want to share that each speaker has a limit of two minutes per person and if you would raise your hands if you're here to speak okay mr smile you can go ahead and come on up to the lectern good afternoon shane smiley brush hill road i want to thank the board for going asking metro legal for input on fair park phase two looking forward to that information i'm also asking the fair board today to ask ron gobble to stop when I talked to him last meeting, he said he would stop when the fair board asked him to. This fair park phase two has had no legislative, it's got no legislative history. You just got done reading how to file a writ of cert if there's a decision of the fair board that is made that you disagree with. Well, in this case, there has been no decision because it's never come before the fair board. It hasn't, become, it hasn't come before the parks board. It hasn't come before the Greenway Board Commission. This is being literally bulldozed down the throats and is a fundamental change to the use of this facility in a time when we've had public hearings for Fair Park Phase 1, for the soccer stadium, for this expo building, a couple of years on the speedway. But here, this is a fundamental change to the use of the property that is being literally bulldozed down through our throats with no legislation. So I'm asking you to put that to a stop today, and I think you're going to hear some changes to what was proposed and what you were told. I mean, like... Think about this. You were told that this is what was going to happen. And, oh, by the way, we're already under construction. And then you were told that there was going to be no earth moved until sometime this fall because of planning schedules. But because of what you guys have done and asking for input on this, the bulldozers have been moving this month. Please put a stop to this. Have a public hearing and do this in a fundamentally correct way because nobody in Metro has the ability to come to this facility and fundamentally change the uses of this facility and take away additional parking without the input of this board and the board has had no input to this. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Okay, we are going to now move to monthly reports and I'll call on Satrice for financial update, please. The financial information presented today is preliminary and all the revenue and expenses for May 2023 may not have been recorded to the ledgers as of June 12, 2023, when this report was created. The preliminary actuals through May 2023 are as follows. Revenue is approximately $3.1 million. Expenditures around $3.7 million resulting in a net loss of approximately $540,200. Depreciation expense is $1.1 million, so the total net loss is roughly $1.6 million. Below you will find an itemized list of our revenues and expenses. Our top three revenue sources are flea market, corporate sales events, and the divisional fair. Flea market revenue is roughly $846,000, $129, which is 27% of our total revenue. Corporate sales events is around $1.1 million, which is 37%. And the divisional fare is $546,200, which is 17% of our total revenue. Our top three expenses are payroll, 
purchase services and low cap. Payroll expense is approximately $1.4 million, which represents 39% of our total expenses. Purchase services expense is $775,361, which is 21%. Low cap expense is around $407,300, which represents 11% of our total expenses. For June 2023, our revenue projection is approximately $97,300. We anticipate receiving 57% from the flea market, 35% from corporate sales events, and 8% from the racetrack and contracts. On the Asian report, we have approximately $4,500 in outstanding invoices and all the promoters have been contacted and invoiced, and we expect payment soon. Are there any questions? Mr. Trees, thank you for the update. When I'm looking at the revenue line items, am I correct to understand when I see the delta between the budget and year to date, does that show that we're tracking above our budgeted expected revenues? So, for example, the flea market says the budget's 777000 and we're year-to-date 846000 Would that mean that we're 10% above budget? Correct. So that would mean that we have generated more revenue than we budgeted to it, we expected in our budget? For that line item, yes. Okay. That's good. I just want to comment that both the flea market corporate sales and divisional fare look to be 10% over, um, or 10 percent over budget for revenue, which is obviously very positive. just want to point that out and say good job. Thank you. All right, seeing nothing else, we're going to move on to an events update, and I will call on Director Womack. So in your packets, you have um, three pretty full calendars. If you look at June, July, and August, um, added, um, I did this last month too, but per everybody's um, request, I added soccer games, um, and some major stadium events on there, such as uh, concerts, are on there. We do have some new events um, that we're welcoming to campus over the next three months, but you'll see we have an extremely, extremely full schedule, and that is definitely the reason why you're seeing that we are above projected revenues for events. We've also implemented for events a post-event client satisfaction survey. So once an event comes in, we do send them a SurveyMonkey link so that they can tell us how we're doing um, so that we can evaluate that for uh, continual improvement. And so far, we have gotten 10 out of 10 stars for everything that we've done. So uh, our event services staff and our operations staff is just doing an amazing job serving our clients and it's reflecting in the survey results. Anybody have any questions for Director Womack? Commissioner Hartley. Director Womack, thank you for that report. Um, so do you attribute the revenues over budget primarily to the additional events you've booked? Yes. What we did, so what we do when we budget um, we did the same thing. We, we used the previous year as kind of that template or the starting point and project up a little bit, you know, kind of challenge ourselves a little bit, adding a little bit to the year prior. Um, but we've even exceeded that target because of events. And we're also being a lot more, um, we're trying to upsell, frankly. I mean, taking more opportunities to provide our clients with, you know, uh, ancillary equipment rentals and, you know, enhancing those opportunities, making uh, our clients aware that we can offer those services as well, rather than contracting them out to an external event company. Thank you. Uh, one follow-up and then I'll jump to you, Diego. Uh, the follow-up is just, so that strategy makes sense. You're trying to obviously increase revenue by uh, driving more dates into the calendar. Uh, have you thought at all or have you done any analysis over whether the incremental uh, expense, are, are, you, are you winning on the expense to profit sort of uh, analysis there? Is the additional work being offset by the revenue or are you sort of 
uh, breaking even? Are we increasing our expenses in tandem with the increased revenue? Not to the degree that our revenue is increasing. Appreciate the question. We're still able to manage all of the events and the turnovers. You'll see, and I'll give you an example of something that does take a little bit of, you know, strategic planning, I guess, um, for scheduling. If you look at the third week in July, you'll see that the flea market loads in on the 20th, and we don't have an end in sight until the 30th. So that is quick turnover of flea market to bar exam from bar exam to drum show and the sneaker culture show. So that's what we do is a little bit of creative scheduling so that we can make sure that we're turning over the buildings. What I will tell you as far as kind of strategic decision making and some challenges I think that we're going to face. To your point, the more events that we add to our calendar, there is going to be a tipping point for the number of staff that we currently have to be able to service them effectively. Um, so we're going to take a really hard look this fiscal year at our staffing levels to see if they're really appropriate and can keep up with even any, uh, uh, keeping this stable and increasing our event load because we do think that we're starting to be at a tipping point to make sure we're able to service them and, you know, certainly not burn out the 19 employees that we have currently. Commissioner oh. Guarte. Thank you. Uh, two questions for me. The first one is understanding, I, I agree that it seems to be performing better than last year, but is the baseline low? because last year was not necessarily a particularly productive year, definitely another one before that. So that's a question number one. And then the other one, I think there's a great point to see. Uh, you can be making more money at the top, but not necessarily make, making more money after that. So yeah, what is, how is the, if there's a 10, it's not necessarily 10% on average increase in revenue, but let's say, let's use the three main growth pieces, right? How did we grow in expenses? What is your net increase? in revenue and how is that uh, going down through the p and I'll let, so I'll answer your first question, which was, remind me. I, uh, how can we, how can we soften the projections? Oh, because uh, yes. Before we take a full victory lap, is the baseline too low? So we were lower than of course 2019 because we're kind of coming off of COVID. However, right. we've seen a substantial increase in events, event revenue as a whole. Um, we're actually in the process um, of really evaluating what that percentage increase is. We just don't have the numbers for you today, but we're definitely looking into giving you a little bit more insight on kind of apples to apples to your point. But yeah, we did not have a a fully, we didn't project a full event calendar, but yet that's what we're experiencing because we weren't sure exactly how fast we were going to rebound coming off COVID. Just an observation there is we probably also did not project expense wise a year full of events, right? And that, and that can, uh, reacting to expenses that you did not project for tends to be more expensive than the ones that you plan for, but just again, uh, looking at and that's bridging to the other question, yeah. not necessarily looking for an answer right now as to what are the margins, but is the margin growing? Is it same? Is it decreasing? Because then being more productive as an asset that you're overbooking yourself, but you're not necessarily making more money out of every dollar that comes in. Like yeah. you said, we're going to get to a cliff where mm -hmm. you might not want to go as fast. So right. just observation. No, we'll we'll get Citrice and I will will definitely dive into that and look at that for you. We did we did actually increase some of our expense lines in the budget last year because you know rates are going up. So most of it there were some hour needed for like purchase services, for instance, custodial help, security help. Mm -hmm. So while we budgeted for known fee increases. There were some hours that we embedded in there too right. to account for the load. Right. Yeah, just to, yeah. even if it's surface level analysis of your fixed expenses versus your 
expenses that would only move if you sell more events, yep. how that's behaving, that would be very helpful for, for us to understand the, the net gains or not. Hopefully it is net gains, but uh, thank you for that. Any other questions? Yes. Commissioner Allen. Uh, Director Womack, could we get a copy of the survey that you send out so that we can sure. go over the questions and see what they look like? Yep. Thank you. Commissioner Hartley. I just wanted to really, let's all take a, take a moment and stop and think about Diego's question. It's really good. Um, I really think, I, I mean, I appreciate the strategy of driving incremental events, but I think it's important for us all to remember that what, you know, what the purpose of the fairgrounds is. Again, it's, it's a public asset. It's for the, the constituents in, in Davidson County and, and our, our visitors. It's got the protected charter uses. So I definitely appreciate uh, driving more revenue, but I think we should always just be mindful of the sort of order of operations of, you know, the fair, the traditional uses, the local racing and those kinds of things. And obviously I'm not, this is not a critique. It's just sort of to re, re always refocus ourselves on, you know, how are we making sure this is a public asset? Thank you, Commissioner Hurley. Anybody else? Commissioner Hendricks. Hey, sorry for uh, being late. I got caught up by that train, <laughs> that pesky train. Um, but, uh, my question will be about the fair. And if we will be having an upcoming fair, and if we are, what is, is there an update as to the dates, all of that stuff? Because I know I've seen on television, Wilson County Fair is already advertising. What are we doing to to publicize our fair and um, and also uh, raise money from it, the sponsorships and, and all that. So Scott could not be here today. We are having a fair. And if I look at my calendar really quick, we always open the Friday after Labor Day. So we will be opening on September 8th and it will run through September 17th. So the 8th to the 17th. Um, we do have... Um, Contracts that we secured last year for for those items that he's going to be starting to um, advertise for those. We've got tickets on order. Um, Wilson County, for instance, they're about a month ahead of us in their fair. So we'll come a, about a month after theirs. So we're a, our timing isn't exactly the same. But yes, he is working. He's got a sponsorship deck and is already pursuing all of those partnerships. So will we, be, will we be able to get an update at the next meeting or maybe I, I, absolutely. a report before the meeting? Yeah, I'll, I'll have them do probably something earlier for you um, and not wait a month. How about that? Any other questions, comments? Hey, we'll move on to executive director's report. I'm, I'm sorry, Sherry. I did not realize we were on number B. I do have one additional comment. Sure. And the comment is just to say, I appreciate uh, the representatives from yeah. soccer being here. Uh, that was a request that I had and several uh, fair board commissioners had. And I really appreciate that because it's just good to have that open communication. So we appreciate that. Okay, uh, Mary, we do. We would love for you to come up and share a report with us right now. Thank you. button there. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon. Thanks. Mary Kabara on behalf of Nashville SC. I will give a quick update on the club and also talk about our first non-soccer event. Uh, from a team perspective, the club is performing well. We're second place in the Eastern Conference. We hope it stays all year. We know that may not happen, um, but everything is clicking on the field for folks. Uh, we held three soccer matches during the month of May. So that brings us to nine home MLS matches to date. Our next match is Saturday, June 17th against St. Louis. If you don't have tickets, it's one of those. We have the top offense, which is St. Louis against the top defense in all MLS. So we're looking in there. This is their first year in the league. So we're looking for an exciting evening on Saturday. 
from some of the kind of housekeeping matters, we've um, at the beginning of the season, we provided a supply of no parking yard signs at our retail store, which is just right up there on Benton. We had replenished that supply there. Um, the retail store is open generally noon to six ish or 10 to six most days um, and folks could stop by a couple minor tweaks that we've made. We moved our ride chair location to Craighead. Uh, we used that for the concert. It worked well. And so we'll continue doing that for soccer matches. And that was really actually part of the original transportation plan. We are in the process of setting up an email account for neighbors to use to report parking and match day matters. And I'll go ahead, similar to what we did for the concert, share that with the NIAC group. They can then send it out to their respective uh, organizations. So that's kind of the normal soccer activity update. Uh, we did hold our first non-soccer event and concert last week uh, with Shania Twain, approximately 26,000 fans. Prior to the concert, we provided a phone number that's manned on the concert day, as well as an email for neighbors to use to report any parking or other issues related to the concerts. We've been observing that as people have had issues, they've been sending emails to the fair board and to other people, and we really need to try to direct them to the club because we can manage those and address those. Uh, we also um, included a message to ticket holders when we sent out kind of the final one, just asking them to please respect the neighborhood, that as you can imagine, with the concert goers, most of the people who attended this concert had never been to this stadium and didn't know how things operate. Our fans, while they're not perfect, they're kind of getting the drill down. And then after the concert, ran a big kind of PSA message on the scoreboard asking them to please, you know, respect the, like, the neighborhood as their own, you know, don't litter, don't speed, you know, just try to do the right thing. Um, I know that on our messaging system, we had one message about a block driveway that we passed on to other folks. And so this was our first time trying this. We'll continue to do this on the concerts. It's also why we thought for the soccer matches, we'll add that email out there so that people can send that. We'll you know, monitor it and address it. Granted, we cannot solve 100% of the issues, but if we hear about what they are, we can make sure that the, they're passed along to the respective folks. Um, Sherry's our sound expert, I'm not, but we also, as part of our agreement, said we would measure sound uh, outside the stadium during the concert. It ranged from 70 to 86 decibels, and in talking to some of our sound experts and other folks, my layman's terms won't do this justice, but what I would describe it is at the low end, it's kind of a loud traffic noise. At the high end, it's a, loud, a lawnmower. If you try to translate that to the soccer match, the lower end is closer to kind of the regular soccer match noise, and then the high end kind of when we're scoring. Um, this is something that we'll continue to do. Happy to, you know, get further details, but, you know, just wanted to share the highlights today. And then the last part related to that is under our agreement with the fairgrounds, we share 50% of the net parking revenue when we use fairgrounds sites for non-soccer events. Uh, we did use four lots for this event. And while our team is still accumulating the data, I think our rough estimate, it's going to be somewhere between 15 and $20,000. Um, I would imagine by the end of the month, we'll have that finalized and then we'll just cut a check to the fairgrounds. Going forward, it will depend on the number of lots that are used, how many tickets are sold. But this is kind of our first time through the process. We'll work through that and we'll be better at kind of estimating what it looks like. But I know somebody had raised a question a couple months ago before we'd even sold tickets and didn't really know. But, you know, we've got a process in place. And so as future non-soccer events occur with paid parking, that's how we'll be handling those. And be pleased to take any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Mary? Diego. Uh, this is, I guess, part question, part suggestion. Uh, let's see what it turns into. Um, uh, while working for uh, Metro a few months ago, I was able to participate with Hub Nashville quite a bit. And we were able to integrate Hub Nashville with a lot of things as the, the main gateway for constituents to communicate with Metro. And it has been incredibly successful, right? From crisis moments, uh, bombing, tornado, COVID, call it whatever. I think if, if it doesn't exist already for managing an email where you're going to get complaints, trust me, I know how painful that can be. Uh, I would strongly recommend that 
talking to, to Hub National and happy to make any uh, particular introduction at the operational level because for Hub to be able to collect a lot of those directly from constituents to come to Metro, they do a fantastic job of partnering with external organizations and they can save you time, money, and you don't have to re-educate the constituent or the concert goer or the soccer game goer to where to report things or more importantly, the neighbor that will be bothered because someone parked in front of them. You can create very, uh, Hub Natural has an incredibly powerful CRM that is very, very good at uh, tracking all this type of stuff. So you might, uh, other than you might not want to share all the data with Metro, but we, uh, you yeah, don't have to respond to that piece. Appreciate that. And it could lend us to some technology that could be more helpful that we could use like that. But um, I will be happy to explore that. Yeah, the, the Hub app had incredible adoption through Tornado and, and um, COVID. And now it's widely used through the county to report everything. And it would take someone in uh, the Hub team about 10 minutes to set you up with a request type for reporting a soccer complaint. And yeah. that's it. And you're good to go literally in an hour or okay. less. Thank so, you. Yep. Anybody else? Commissioner Hartley. Mary, thank you for this information. It's been very helpful. One thing that I think will be uh, even better moving forward, not to put more work on you, but um, the statistics you provided, uh, the parking receipts, the sort of re the short top line recap of your uh, soccer and non-soccer events. I'd love to get that in a report that we could get before the fairgrounds. I'm guessing you're reading from notes, so hopefully you could just share this with Laura. And uh, it doesn't have to be very formal. I just think it'd be good to have that uh, some some data to look at ahead of our meeting. Uh, so just, that was my request. We can do that. Okay, thanks. It's there's kind of a similar protocol with the sports authority where all of the partners kind of provide a what they call it is a venue report. Um, there's perhaps even some things that we can uh, piggyback from that, but we can um, certainly get you a one page. You could also, I mean, I probably would be happy to receive that report that, to avoid you having to do additional work. That's probably sufficient for our, our needs. Uh, I did have one follow-up question or note, if I could. It's not a question for you, Mary, it's for us to think about. If they do one event and they get 20,000, where our cut is 20,000 for parking, we should consider whether, you know, who, who is, has the competitive advantage to program? You know, if they can drive 20,000 on one event, what is, and I'm not saying I know the answer to this. I'm saying for you to think about, Laura, it's like, is it better to give a date over to help them program more so we can split the parking costs uh, versus programming something ourselves? So just something to think about. I mean, again, there's no right or wrong answer. It's probably a mixture of what the, you know, what the demand is for events. There are different types. This is a different facility than the soccer stadium, but we should consider which is a better use of our, our resources. One more for you. you know, I was the one who uh, brought up the question about parking a couple months ago. Yes. Um, is there, do we start from the lots that you use that are fairground owned? Do we start from a base of zero or do you have to get to a certain level before we do the 50% split? It starts from zero. Okay. So if, if there was a lot and we had one car on it and made $10, we get dollars. you would we get, get five. five. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? I have uh, one question. Commissioner Hendricks. Um, so we've been um, hearing over the last couple of weeks that like soccer does not like the idea that we're expanding the racetrack, right? Or we would like to, um, we would like to renovate the, the racetrack. But we've been having these meetings for over a year um and we've not had a dialogue about that and so it's kind of caught it caught me by surprise um to see that one of our partners does not like something that we you know have approved um as a, as a body um my question is and if you like is there a way to sit down and actually have a conversation about what the needs are for you know, soccer or, you know, how can we as an entity um, be better partners? Uh, and so that way we're not making, you know, decisions in the future that could potentially or that some of our partners feel would be detrimental to their practice or what they would like to, to do. 
I appreciate your question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer it or um, I hear what you're saying. I would need to go back and talk to our team and we could respond to you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Mary. You. Okay, let us move on to old business. Executive director's report. <laughs> Sorry, I just have one thing. Um, we have Mr. Ronnie Haywood with us. I'm going to put him on the spot. Ronnie, stand up. Yay, this is Ronnie. This is our new operations manager, and he has done really fantastic. So I just wanted to introduce him. He's the newest member of our team. So welcome, formally, Ronnie. Everybody, that's Ronnie. <laughs> Um, also, just to give you a general update, we've had uh, we've been advertising for the event services manager. We are in our last round of interviews this week. We're going to have three final candidates come in for kind of a shadowing opportunity so that they can kind of see us in action as we load in. Um, I think we have Porter Flea this weekend, so it's going to be really fun. Um, get them an idea, but really top-notch candidates, extremely qualified, great resumes, um, fantastic interviews. So I'm, I'm really optimistic that we're going to find a great team member to, to join us. Commissioner Hartley. Hey, Laura, that's great. You know, there's always a question, Sherry. There's always a question. It's a, the active listener over here. Uh, Laura, I, I really appreciate that and, and welcome to our new team member. You know, one thing that could help me, uh, and I think a lot of us relatively new to the, the board, is uh, could you give us an org chart of your, of your organization, maybe with like just a quick summary of everybody's job description? That would help me understand, uh, you know, Christy and Satrice, we see every month, we don't see everybody. So that'd be great to send out to the board. Are there any more questions? Any comments? Who was our previous event manager and how long they stay on? That was Carla Miller, and she stayed six months and then moved out of state. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll move on. Now we'll go to Old Business, Fairgrounds Improvement Project, and I will call up Mr. Gobble and Mr. Henley. Hi, good afternoon, board, staff, council. Um, missed you all last month. Um, but I've got an update for you. Um, you should have documents in your packets. Um, I'll start with two comments. The first one is my standard disclaimer that I give that I'll be reviewing numbers um, that are, that are um, presented to you in arrears, roughly 45 to 60 days in arrears of what's actively happening out on site here. Um, and the other thing I'll acknowledge is on the last page in your document, um, there is an error in Excel. So there's a, there's a um, financial or numerical error that I'll call it out when I get there, but essentially it just did not grab a sale. So there's a shortage of funding um, on that page. Not a material difference, but I wanted to highlight it just so there's no head scratching as I go through the uh, presentation. Um, I'll start with the, it uh, looks like everyone has the packet in colors. So I'll start with the blue document. Um, a couple of things to highlight. Um, first, I want to thank Satrice, Sherry, and others on the finance and administrative side. We've had a um, couple of items that we had to get through in terms of purchase orders. We've also been sitting at about 99% um, in this category for a long time. What that means is the expenses are small, um, but the volume is high. And so it becomes a little bit tedious, but we've been doing a good job of managing things there. So um, still tied out, no concerns uh, at all, but we've made it, we made it through some um, administrative uh, closing out of some purchase orders and opening some new ones. And the budget is reflective of some of those changes. So I'd go through those. Um, again, I already highlighted that 99% um, um, in terms of the Expo Center and site improvements. One of the things you'll notice there is the project contingency increased in that section. Uh, one of the things that I've been mentioning to you in the past uh, several months is as we work to complete the multi-purpose building and we got towards the end and near the finish line there, some of those funds would be reduced and they would return to that bucket. And so you're seeing that in that line item, line item now. Um, outside of that, only small expenses in that in that area. But the multi-purpose building, want to give an update. Um, we have got certificate of occupancy for that space. Uh, we are working through 
actually have submitted final payment to our contractor, their K&J Associates. Uh, K&J Associates um, was procured through uh, the Metro procurement process. We didn't do um, a RFQ detailed interview um, with our internal team, but um, the business administration office still requires um, an extensive focus on diversity participation. And while K&J Associates is a small business themselves, um, so again, the award would have been a 100% diversity business award. Um, in the spirit of the program, they did, um, along with the support of Roxy and Bethune, we pushed really hard for them to get some diversity participation on the contract overall. And so they achieved just over 22%, um, the majority of that going to another small business um, located here in Middle Tennessee, um, mid-10 mid contractors. Um, and so both of those um, contracting firms are closing out in the process of closing out now. So wanted to give that report. It's a smaller project, small but mighty, so not as extensive of a diversity report, um, but very much effective and very much um, achieved the, the objectives of 20% um, DBE for that project. The other line items or the other sections, excuse me, on the, on the first page um, are reflective of projects that have been ongoing. Uh, the demo line item still has a little bit of funding left in there. Um, just to close out, those funds are pretty much reserved or earmarked for um, dollars we might expect to expend related to some temporary storage that's been coming in throughout the time um, that the multi-purpose building's been underway. And then also we have funds um, associated with the grants and the Speedway um, based on any overage that might appear um, outside of the 4% funds that were allocated there. Don't wanna move forward if there are any questions. Does anybody have questions up to this point? All right, awesome. go ahead and move on, Mr. Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, the next page is uh, related to Fair Park. So it'll look a little bit different than you've seen in the past months. Um, essentially, we've condensed the funding into one section. Um, in previous reports, you would have seen um, 218, approximately 218,000 sitting in Fair Park Phase 1. Um, that funding has just now been moved into the tracking document, uh, the tracking section for Fair Park Phase 2. Um, essentially, they're just bringing that total. It was a flat $7 million before, now it's $7.2. Um, there has been activity related to Fair Park that's reflected here, but again, uh, 45 to 60 days in arrears. So there are invoices that we're currently reviewing yet to be submitted, um, but that work that's been done uh, to date and submitted to date is reflected here. Any questions about that one? Commissioner Hamilton. Commissioner Hartley. I will defer to you if you're ready. I know, right? Go. Okay. Um, Fair Park Phase 2, this is probably a question for uh, Ron, but just wanted to throw it out there. Obviously, we heard in public comment, Mr. Smiley had a question about the work that's begun. So the question is probably first would be, just wanted to get a status update. We did ask for the last meeting. We will about. have that shortly in this section. So okay. we'll legal is going to address that with us. Okay. I'm going to defer that question until Sherry tells me to. Thank you. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you. Anybody have any other questions? All right. I'll get to the last page, infrastructure part two. Um, so I'll start by highlighting the um, Excel error. So if you'll look at the sources column, um, there's a column there in the second line item where when you get to the pay to date and cost complete column, they're blank. So there should be there should be something in those columns that should go and flow straight to the bottom. We haven't started spending significant funds there. So if you look in the pay to date column, that is accurate. But the cost to complete column um, in that first little section on total sources, just it doesn't grab that amount. So just want to make sure that it, when you look at it, those two um, numbers will not align. Uh, but the total at the very bottom of the page, total project cost, um, is correct. Um, the, the use of those funds to date, uh, we have submitted um, an invoice. Um, it's been reviewed. We're working through the payment process now for the plaza and road, uh, which is part of a participation agreement um, with the fairgrounds. So that that's process has been started. We're excited that a lot of the work has been done. Of course, that was up and around the grandstands and speedway area. Um, that area has been in effect and been used. We're now just, again, 45 to 60 days in arrear. So those costs are playing catch up. 
Outside of that, um, this is where the majority of the funding um, remains in terms of our budget presentation. So as we go forward, you'll see this become a lot more populated as you've seen um, what I call the blue sheet, but the fairgrounds improvement sheet. So if there are further questions or if there's anything that's in this document that you'd like to see further detail, let me know. Thank you so much. Yes, director. Just wanted to mention that one thing that we're looking at that we've received quotes for is to add digital signage uh, to the fairgrounds. Um, the good thing is it looks like we're able to utilize the old pole that's out on Nolensville Pike now and just kind of redo it to save some money there. Um, but we got some, so we're working through that now to be able to, you know, have a programmable uh, LED probably six foot by 12 foot display so that people driving up and down Nolensville can see what we're doing here. I think that is gonna be a huge help with exposure and getting people aware of some of the events that we do. Uh, Commissioner uh, Owens. I gotta get this to work, oh, there we go. When you said save some money on the poll, how sturdy is the poll? <laughs> Well, they've evaluated it, the sign company, and said that it's usable. They're going to cut it down a little bit to make it a touch shorter, to, but they've evaluated the poll and determined that they can reuse it. Hopefully, Commissioner I hope this for a long time. But I have a question. It's about uh, financing and construction and our overall uh, campus here. And thinking about sidewalks, um, I was actually doing some work Monday, and I ran across a federal grant that's open until July 10th um, that is for sole purpose of building sidewalks in neighborhoods. Is that something that could potentially that we can look at to help defray some costs uh, down the road when it comes to um, us as a body like building sidewalks around our perimeter, like around the campus? Commissioner Hendricks, is that the Metro sidewalk fund that's allocated per district, or is that something? No, else? it's federal. It's a federal. Uh, pro, it's a federal grant that's opened up uh, through the end of July for people to apply to. So it could be, um, you know, any governmental agency or entity can apply for up to, I think it was uh, a couple of million dollars. It's a billion dollars overall to be allocated across the country to build sidewalks. And you can apply from anywhere from a hundred thousand. The the floor is a, is a hundred thousand, and the ceiling is around. It's a it's a few million dollars um, per application that you could be approved for. Director, it might be a timing issue, just because if it's July tenth, all grants have to go through council for acceptance because it is. It increases our spending authority, so that it that does have to have council approval. However, that is something I can certainly pass on to NDOT because our brand new sidewalks along Craighead, which are done, which are going to be fantastic and really helpful, getting patrons from Fair Park over to the expos. Great, those are open. Uh, NDOT covered those through some of their sidewalk programs. So I'll definitely bring it up to NDOT since they manage the sidewalk program. Any other questions? Seeing none, I am going to bring Mr. Gobble up and then I'm going to have Ms. Costonas share the answer to your question and to Mr. Smalley's concern. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just real quick, I think you've covered a lot of this already, but phase two of Fair Park, we are cutting in the greenways right now. We are making a lot of progress, as Laura said. NDOT has stepped up, got that sidewalk in. We much appreciate their participation in this. The, um, we're still working on planting schedules and how we can coordinate those with fairgrounds events. So that is a what's available, what is a lot of shortages in some components of the planting area. And, and obviously what you plant, when you plant it, is very important. So uh, we're still working through all the details of that. Um, part two of infrastructure, we are working closely with NDOT and we go on the, on the Wingrove interchange and who does what and how they do it. 
Obviously, Wego's got issues on their northbound, not issues, but they've got, got to build a northbound bus stop, and, and Wego has some, I mean, MDOT has some funds available for the Northernsville Pike improvements. So we've got to coordinate all that and who does what. That's going on. Uh, we talked about Fair Plaza. I showed you the designs. Fair Plaza and Speedway Alley that's being built in conjunction with the mixed use project. That's heavy in the design and the details and how to coordinate that and phase it in with existing speedway issues and I mean existing speedway criteria and what new construction might, what kind of impact they may have. And then we're working on very, very early phases of continuing Speedway Alley down all the way to Craighead. So those components are all in the process and we're moving well. I think Dirk Melton's here if you want to hear about mixed use. But uh, so Dirk, you want to? Mr. Milton, come on up and we will address mixed use now. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners. Uh, my update today is going to be very brief. Uh, so I reported last month that the uh, structure for the mixed-use building on Block C, as well as the associated garage, is substantially complete with respect to the structure, and that continues uh, to be the case. Uh, we're now installing the roofing materials, the uh, thermoplastic olefin roof on the mixed-use building that will dry that building in, in addition to some windows being installed that will allow for the interior to be uh, begun uh, with respect to its um, build out. So over the next few months, um, it's not going to be nearly as exciting as it has been because the building is in its final shape and size. Uh, so there won't be a lot of work that's apparent from the outside, but there's going to be a lot of work going on from the inside. And those activities include mechanical, electrical and plumbing, uh, rough ends for all those systems, uh, brick installation uh, inside and out, uh, a number of windows, uh, at which point we can start hanging drywall in the month of July. And so the timing is right on schedule to be about a, a year ahead of welcoming our first residents to the building next July. Um, and so uh, everything appears to be right on schedule um, then. With respect to the garage, the uh, MEP rough end continues to be underway. Uh, lights, drains, plumbing uh, for that facility, as well as the uh, garages um, uh, will be, the elevators will be installed uh, beginning in the month of July as well. So uh, in order for those to be activated, uh, we'll need permanent power to the garage. We're uh, getting an ETA, we hope soon, from NES on our 1500 KVA transformer uh, that will be required to get the garage energized. But we're looking forward to doing so as soon as possible so that we can make that 490 space garage available for campus events as soon as possible. So um, with that, we're excited to be uh, moving along and happy to answer any questions you might have. Anyone have any questions or comments? Seeing none, we thank you. I am now going to turn the floor over to Ms. Costonis to share with us the information that we've previously requested. Yes, so I'm following up on the question from Commissioner Hartley at the previous um, commission meeting, following up on some information provided by Mr. Smiley. Is that better? Um, uh, provided by Mr. Smiley um, uh, during the comment period. Um, and um, I had invited Mr. Smiley to um, email me any written documents, but I, I didn't receive anything, sir. Okay, well, uh, having not received any written documents, um, I didn't have anything in writing to analyze, so I relied on my notes from the long conversation that Mr. Smiley and I had following the, um, uh, the, the last board meeting. And um, he had mentioned some uh, sources, um, including um, a statement made by the executive director in minutes, um, uh, regarding the um, status of the pit and tunnel behind the old racetrack, I believe it was, um, and also some expert witness testimony um, in a, a lawsuit, separate lawsuit that um, uh, was given on Metro's behalf, Metro's ex expert witness with regard to um, parking, I believe. and. Um, my conclusion based on both of those is that neither of those um, statements would be binding on the metropolitan government in such a way as to give rise to any kind of actionable entitlement by any other party against Metro. So 
I don't think they're really material. Um, I did look also into the um, uh, more general question of whether there was any, um, that may have been more Commissioner Hartley's question as to whether there was any um, like contractual requirement or anything like that, that um, the Fair Board's failure to approve phase two would have violated. Um, I talked to Laura about that. I talked to Tom Cross about that. Um, uh, Tom was not aware of any contractual um, requirement that that would violate. Um, uh, Laura had a little contextual background that she provided about um, uh, the both the um, uh, kind of phase two and, and future agreements and as to um, uh, the Metro stormwater variance, which was addressed at the last meeting. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I think that that is all proceeding in a manner compliant with the law. That's all I have. Commissioners, do you have any questions? Commissioner Hartley. Thank you uh, for that analysis. Just to summarize and make sure I understand correctly, I think I understand your analysis to be, uh, after looking through all the materials, the all the necessary approvals, both governmental approvals as well as any private transactional contractual approvals, have been met to proceed with the construction of Fair Park Phase 2. So yes, I'm not aware of anything that either law or contract that's been violated by um, what has proceeded so far, um, I've, I'd invite Laura to weigh in about what may happen in the near future. Uh, I was the one who uh, brought up the question to Mr. S or Mr. S no problem, no problem. Um, so previous commissioners or previous boards, they what they approved is is already binding, and there's no there's nothing that uh, we're doing under the board or without approval. So correct. So in order for something to be binding on this commission, it would have to be voted on by a majority of a quorum at an open meeting. So just like a statement made in the minutes or something like that is not going to have that kind of binding impact. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we will move on. And it is time for Bristol update. Mr. Caldwell. And there will be a short video presentation behind me. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, Commissioners. This will be a brief update, but we were excited. We want to be able to share you share with you as we uh, have gotten down the path further with the designs of the. Um, Speedway project. Just a few renderings to give you an idea of how things are looking. I had some stanchions, but um, Laura tried to help me, but I couldn't. I couldn't get them to stay up. So sorry. We're going to go with this. But we have big pictures if anybody wants to see them. Um, you'll notice here in. Um, we'll kind of start in the. The back stretch. So sound wall goes all the way around from. Uh, what is turn one, um, all the way around to the, the proposed building that would be in turn four. You'll go into the infield and see that there are modifications to the infield to level that up and make it far more efficient and usable. Um, we would be modifying the tunnel, so the tunnel would stay in the back stretch that is currently there, but the entrance into the infield would modify some. Uh, there's an additional tunnel that would be added um, right out here, connecting really uh, make it very usable for the expo build, uh, expo center, parking in the infield um, right there in turn three. Um, operational building there inside the, the racetrack, that little brown building that you see there. Um, and as you move out again, that uh, building in turn four, uh, it does extend over more towards the grandstands than maybe you've seen uh, proposed before. And we'll get to it in a minute, but that's actually tied to uh, the suites that would be incorporated into the grandstands, um, as the engineers got into it, they couldn't get quite as much, uh, quite as many of the suites on the main grandstand side um, there at the top that they wanted. So those have been added into the turn four building. So if we can go to that next slide, this is um, kind of looking back from 
I guess that would be Benton Avenue, um, looking towards uh, the back stretch or the back of the front stretch grandstand. Uh, you see the building there to the left, um, and then the grandstand there to the right. Next slide is just another perspective of that, giving you an idea of what it would look like again from Benton Avenue as you go towards um, that front stretch, kind of where a main entrance would be contemplated. And then last uh, picture to share with you is just, um, this is a view from the middle of turns three and four looking towards that building. Um, those would be suites um, during um, events, but that would also be uh, meeting space, conference space for the rest of the year for the community and other types of events that would take place there. You also see the Nashville Fairground Speedway logo. That's the start of the sound wall that would be in place. Uh, again, this still is a work in progress as we head towards those uh, nailing down all the hard costs, but wanted to bring this to you guys and, and give you um, a preview of the exciting work that's being done. It's coming together really nicely. We're encouraged with um, the pricing, the way things are coming together, and we'll, we'll be sure to come back when those things are all finalized. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Caldwell? Commissioner Hartley. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for this presentation. Very helpful. Can you tell us about your, I see them listed here on the front, about your uh, construction, looks like probably construction and design partners. Sure. Um, those were the design group that we're working with, Choate and DLR. Um, those were selected by, if you'll remember in the agreement, there was a, there were two groups. There's a, a, help me with what exactly it's called, Laura, but a design build group, um, which is this, the group that uh, helped us select Choate and DLR. Um, that was the group that we're paying these folks um, to go ahead and put these designs together in anticipation of being able to get to the, the event. And then as we get further along, there's a different group that'll oversee kind of the daily um, input and if there are adjustments to the site plan, all those types of things. Commissioner Owen. Yes, uh, my question is kind of piggyback off of Commissioner Hendricks' concerns with uh, uh, Nashville soccer being uh, not a proponent of this. Um, have you had any previous conversations with them? And if successful and we'll go ahead with the project, how do you foresee the three entities working together with them being not a, not an approval of what's going on. Uh, to answer your first question, yes, we've had uh, we've had meetings, uh, good meetings with Ms. Kavara and and Director Womack and uh, Chairwoman Weiner and others. So yeah, we've had um, quite a few conversations with them. We want to be good neighbors. You know, everyone's entitled to their opinion. We uh, we really feel like we can be a great partner. Uh, we've been encouraged as we talked about the scheduling of events on the property. I think we can all work together. Uh, doesn't mean that we won't have times where we have to have hard conversations, figure things out. That's just sometimes what you do. But uh, we really believe that it can be a great project and it can be very successful for the fairgrounds. And um, we look forward to, to being able to work with them and be good neighbors. Any other questions, comments? Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move into new business, and I'm going to slide Ms. Costonis back in because there is an update to the Open Meetings Act, and I am very happy to share that we already meet most of the criteria, so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's that's exactly right, um, Madam Chair. So um, basically, at the end of the last um, uh, legislative session, the Tennessee Legislature adopted a couple of changes to the um, Tennessee Open Meetings Act. Um, one of which has to do with the publication of agendas, um, that they must be published within 48 hours of the commencement of the meeting. Um, and um, I think that that 
is generally actually done well before that by staff to this commission. And the second being that um, there is, and this is not a new thing to this commission, but it is to many other boards and commissions, a requirement that there be a public comment period at some point during the meeting. Obviously, you all have had tradition of having that already for a, a good amount of time um, with the boards and commissions that don't already have such a process in place. Um, we've been making some recommendations. We've been making recommendations that they do that at the beginning of the board meeting, which you, again, you already do. Um, we've been making recommendations that you set some parameters on um, the number of speakers or the overall time of spe that speakers are allowed to, to engage in the public comment or um, and or um, individual time limits on individual speakers, which I believe you also already do. And um, the, um, uh, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, and yeah, that there, that people be, um, uh, sign up before, that there be a sign up sheet that people sign up to speak before the meeting. Um, and that they um, must be present and, and write their name on a list to indicate that they would like to provide comments. Does that include their address, contact information, or just their name? Um, I mean, I, I think it's fine for it to include the both. Anybody have any questions about that? Any comments? Commissioner Hartley. Just to make sure we state the obvious, it sounds like uh, you've read us the new requirements that our uh, practices are very close to in compliance and or they will be in compliance moving forward. Or that, that, yes, that yes, it goes into effect step. July 1, and I basically think you are already in compliance with it, so it should not be a change really in terms of like how you all proceed and operate. I'm going to take this opportunity to give a huge shout out to both our director and Christy in terms of putting this agenda together, getting the minutes together, letting me review them ahead of time, and making sure we have all our ducks in a row. I mean, it's a big deal. It's a lot of work. And so we owe both of them a debt of gratitude um, for the continuity that we've got. Okay, seeing nothing else, we're going to move on. And um, we have nominations and election of officers. So I am going to open the floor for nominations for chair. What are the rules or guidelines for officers? Because I don't think I received any of that information. So I, I can read to you from the yeah, rules I have and no procedures. Idea. We're not allowed to talk, so I'm like, who? What do we, what do we do? <laughs> um, uh, so um, elections and board officers are addressed in the rules and procedures of the fair board. Um, so it says that chairperson and vice chairperson are positions that shall be elected once a year. Multiple consecutive terms are permitted. Such elections shall take place at the June meeting. And it says board officers, one chairperson. The chairperson shall preside at all meetings of the fair board, except as otherwise authorized by the fair board. He, she shall, shall sign and the secretary shall attest all contracts, reports, and instruments adopted by the fair board. The chairperson may submit such recommendations and, inf and information as he, she may consider proper concerning the business fairs and policies of the fair board. Further, the chair person shall have the right to debate and vote on any issue before the board and then two vice chairperson in the absence or incapacity of the chairperson the vice chairperson shall have the duties of the chairperson in the case of resignation of the chairperson the vice chairperson shall perform the duties until power formally passes to a new commission in the absence of both when a quorum is present for a regular or special meeting an interim chairperson shall be elected from those present um, then there's also the position of secretary um, which I think is fulfilled by staff um, and you know, discussion of minutes and records, which I think um, the, our chair has already addressed. There is a provision about vacancies that said, should the officer chairperson or vice chairperson become vacant, the fair board shall at its next meeting, a regular meeting, determine the successor to the position. Um, and I mean, I think we follow Robert's rules generally. You know, there are um, provisions about like nominations and um, uh, you know, um, just voting on, you know, who you want to elect for the following year. Do 
you have any follow up to that? So, are we able? I don't know what Diego or Todd or Jasper thinks. Uh, could we delay or extend our current chair uh, until she leaves? And, and then if one of our other commissioners, he may be successful in his, uh, his uh, candidacy, candidacy for council seat, then we would have two more commissioners if that happened. Um, so, I mean, I think I would answer that in a kind of combination of ways, which is um, the, the rules do say that the meeting shall be in June. I assume that Ms. Wiener was elected last June. So, and has been in office for a year. So uh, we would be required to have an election today, essentially. Now, once you have elected someone, there are provisions for resignation and vacancies. So just because they're elected for a year term doesn't mean that they will serve a year term. And, you know, if, they, if there were to be, you know, a resignation due to other obligations, then you all would have the opportunity immediately there following to elect new officers. Can, can I? Uh, yes. Please, go ahead. Uh, let me see if, if this uh, to put some grease in the process. Uh, can, uh, I, I love uh, continuity of business as things are. Uh, definitely as a newer board member, I, I think that helps. And because of the reasons already stated, which one is the first one that we have to? Chairperson. Chairperson. So uh, I, I want to nominate the current chair to continue to be chair. Yeah. I second. Go ahead. Oh, wait, wait, that's fine. Go ahead. I mean, I assume you're going to call no, for No, you can go first. Hmm. Well, I just had a quick question on the rules. I, I was listening really quickly, and I've read them before, but is the rule that upon resignation we, re, we, we elect a new at the next meeting or that the vice chair is elevated? Because it seemed to say both at various points. I couldn't yeah. tell. Uh, it, it is. It does say both of those things. It says in the vice chairperson's description of office, that in the case of resignation of the chairperson, the vice chairperson shall perform the duties until power formally passes to a new chairperson. So that formal passage of power would then be addressed in section D vacancies should the office of chairperson or vice chairperson become vacant. And of course, if the vice chairperson steps up to chair, then certainly the vice chair position would then become vacant. Um, the fair board shall at its next regular meeting determine the successor to the position. Follow-up question, and first a comment, which is, um, Sherry, I've really appreciated how well you've run this, and I'm very excited uh, to see you continue in that role. Uh, I'm also in support of that. Uh, my question is, uh, and sort of not to put the nose right on it, but is there any reason that, so Jasper and Sherry are both running for Metro Council. If they're elected, do they have to resign from the board? I'm assuming the plan is yes. Yes. Okay. So you just opened my door. Um, oh, I was asking. I was asking legal. You want to take it? I, I mean, I, I, my answer to the question would also be yes, but I, I defer to the chair. Thanks. So my favorite word in the English language is unopposed. <laughs> so yes, I'm going into Metro Council. Um, I will be sworn in, and prior to being sworn in, I will tender my resignation. Um, not knowing what's going to happen with Jasper, because he's not my favorite word, um, then that will give us an opportunity to have somebody come into the seat um, and give us more of a, a continuity and a stability um, moving forward, because I will let them know when the resignation will be effective, and they can start with the process of looking for a replacement. So it'll be pretty seamless. And I, when are when are council elections? They're in August, right? Elections are August third. And your what's your term start? October first. So you have the month of September off, and during that time is when you have your swearing ins and getting everything set up. Um, and then the runoff. If there's a runoff, like in his district, then it's um, September fourteenth. So in actuality, we could wait until October. 
And yes. do, do we have to wait for two other commissioners to be appointed so then all five to choose or between the three of us can vote? As long as you have a quorum. Yeah, that's correct. Well, the quorum is three out of time, correct? I'll just add, and again, I, I, uh, I'm very in favor of continuity as well. I think one thing for us to be prudent and consider not to be a negative Nancy, but there's obviously been big decisions we've made at the fair board. We have not all agreed. We have agreed disagreeably, which is something that's very important to me. Um, I think we should consider, uh, no disrespect, Jasper, we, we should consider, do we want to have our elected chair and vice chair potentially resign at the same time? Uh, it might be prudent to not do that. And only because I want to make sure we have a continuity of leadership. I'm okay if we want to go that way. I just want everybody to think about it and make sure Laura has good direction and not a, a vacuum uh, of a period of time where she has no no chair or vice chair to uh, be able to defer to for difficult questions. In previous uh, commissioners' resonations, how soon was the seat filled? It has varied from two months to over a year. Anybody have any other comments? Did you have something else? I guess so. If I'm just thinking, so if both of you all are successful, it will still most likely be uh, it still be a three three person vote. So to um, remember that the Metro Council term and meetings end August the whatever the third is that the 18th of August whatever the third. Tuesday is that's their last meeting and so whatever unless the vice mayor is to call a special meeting for whatever reason um, that would be the only opportunity that they would have to get somebody in the seat prior to for sure my resignation and so you would probably be waiting if Jasper is fortunate enough to be elected then you would be waiting just on his seat to be filled provided the council doesn't defer it again so your point, oh yeah, I see what you're saying. You're saying you, you can resign before council ends so then they can catch one more seat before the next council term begins. That is what was explained to me. But again, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> and how did you become unopposed in your neighborhood? <laughs> well, because I was probably stupid enough to do this again. <laughs> Anybody have any other questions or um, derogatory comments? <laughs> Look, I have, I have one more comment, which is, again, everybody knows I voted against the Bristol deal. I had problems with it. That's okay. We're in the process of, and as Jerry just described, we're in the process of going through and it's, it's being approved further in the city, but we're also sort of moving forward. Uh, so if I wanted to say you could say well let's uh slow things down but i think you know we owe the staff and the, the the site we've made a decision to approve and move forward so i think it makes sense for us to have continuity of leadership so i would also think we should have sherry at least through whether she whenever she's willing to be in charge so uh that's my statement for the record anybody have any other questions or comments Well, we have a nomination. We have a second for the nomination on the floor. Um, is there any discussion about the nomination in particular? No. Nope. Okay, I will call for the vote. Actually, I believe... Okay. Yes, it would be better for, for Jasper to handle the gavel um, for the vote on chair, and then for Sherry to handle the gavel on the vote for vice chairs. Okay, so hearing no other nominations uh, for a chair, consider the nominations closed. Um, all those in favor, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? All right, unanimous. Thank you very much for your trust. I appreciate it. Okay. Let us move into vice chair. Do I hear any nominations from the floor? 
of nominating um, Gaspar Sesma. Is there a second of the nomination? Second. Are there any other nominations from the floor? Seeing none, I declare the nominations closed. Is there any discussion? Mr. Hendricks, do you accept the nomination? Uh, yes. Okay. I will now call for the vote. All in favor, Commissioner Owens? Aye. Commissioner Hartley? Aye. Commissioner Hendricks? Aye. Commissioner Aguarte? Aye. And I am a yes, so thank you for continuing on. Commissioner Hendricks, you are our vice chair. I am now going to move to the open range increase for the executive director. And in front of you, where is it? I don't have it. Thank you. Okay, so in front of you, you have a list that I asked our director to put together of everything that she has spearheaded, um, moved forward, touched, engaged in, um, in fiscal year 23. And I have to share that it has been my absolute pleasure to witness this firsthand. It has been my, um, from a business perspective, I am a practice manager consultant and I teach people to do operations, finance, marketing, and to know the metrics. And the team that Laura has put together is exceptional. She's a juggler. Um, she manages um, her staff with a fair, even hand. And um, I will share without um, taking away any confidentiality. Um, we do have a staff member who has a pretty extensive, um, very sudden concerning family matter. And she immediately took it upon herself to do everything possible to help this person, to help the family, and to see that they get what they need um, in order to make it through. And she has risen, risen rather above and beyond the call of duty um, time and time again. Um, when Laura was out for that week when she was sick, she has a staff and she has a right arm and a left arm in Satrice and Christy who stepped right up. I had the opportunity to meet with the staff, all 20 of them, and um, they were supportive. They were concerned. They were right there, Johnny on the spot, to step in and do whatever it took to make things move. And this is the kind of person that I believe um, is the future of this property, can deal with um, fairly our campus partners, no matter who they are, and um, can make things for the staff work and do it in a way that's equitable for everybody. Um, I am going to ask for a motion for an open range increase for her. Um, she has historically been at the bottom of the pile of um, directors for Metro government for different departments. And I think it's time that we start leveling that playing field um, for her, um, not only for her personally, but I think the message that we send that when you are in this level position with um, the amount of um, authority and responsibility that has been piled on her, I think it's, it's um, incumbent upon us to reward that. I mean, I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make the motion so we can have a discussion because we had the same discussion last year. Um, and so my question will be, will, will this bring her to that level that no. we discussed? No, <laughs> like, it will not. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, I move that we um, that we approve the uh, the uh, the pay increase, the open range pay increase uh, for Director Wilbank. Is there a second? I, I would. So, if I will second, then I can question later. Okay. okay so now yeah. we're going to move into discussion. Since we have a first and a second, we can open 
discussion. So go ahead. Um, what is the amount of open range? What is open range? So Trace, do you want to explain that? Open range is where the commission can increase one salary anywhere from 0% upward, which differs from increments. Increments is when there's a 3% annual increase. So when you are in an open range position, as Director Womack is, you all have the ability to give her an increase of 0% and upward. So let me just clarify. In the motion, I specified an open range increase. Through discussion, we will then amend the motion to stipulate whether it's a 3%, 5%, 10%, 10%, whatever, increase, okay? And I guess Jasper leads me to my second question. He said it was voted on last year, so I was discussed. Yes, discussed how her pay is at the bottom, but uh, the uh, uh, We discussed last year about how her pay was at the bottom of all the other uh, directors, if you look at other, um, other metro entities, she's at the at the bottom, and so if we're, you know, um, I know we're, you know, we're a generated a revenue generator, you know, body, and we have to be careful about our finances and how we spend. Mm -hmm. and, but but the work, the level of work that's being done, you know, are we really compensating her for the amount of time and you know and the effort and for the success um, that. That have, that we've seen, you know, in this um, on this campus. And budget wise, uh, budget wise, so Trees, are we is it, are we able to do this? Budget wise, how how are we budget? Are we? Oh, I was going to ask Satrice a question. I was waiting for you to get your answer. <laughs> if if uh, I can jump in front of her real quick, uh, I think, and just. Uh, Mechanically speaking, we would vote on yes, open range, or at least open in the open range, but still we would have to do uh, the actual specific conversation on a different date. Is that no, correct? No, we, we can amend it today. Okay, uh, so let me try to be helpful with my, again, inside metro experience and HR processes and whatnot. Um, if I remember correctly, part of the open range, there's also a range that would suggest kind of what other departments and agencies are doing, right? So it's not just you start at zero and you can go all the way up. There, there should be an indication. Hopefully, someone knows what it is now. I'm, uh, I've been gone too long to know it, but uh, that's one. That's one piece. And, and also, I think another thing that we have to clarify, and this is it's semantics, but it matters. It's uh, at the bottom of the executive director range, not at the director range in Metro. That mm -hmm. there's a difference there. Uh, also, to, to take that into consideration. And last, uh, again, a comment from from me is. Uh, to, to second what you were uh, sharing, Sherry, is uh, we want to be as competitive as, as we can to uh, recruit and retain talent. And uh, that that is very important, right? And, and w while we're deciding and thinking on the different numbers is think how much it would cost to have talent that would be as productive if, uh, if it weren't for the actual guardrails put by Metro. Um, which, if anything, it contains the, how much you can do and not the other way around. But, um, but there, there's, there's a percentage of open range that would be suggested and say the 3% plus uh, recommended open range of, I'm just saying this four, that you could go all the way up to seven, but it'll be the board's uh, decision to go over under that. I can show that um, Shannon Hall, who's the director of HR for Metro, um, shared that they typically don't go above 15%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have the leeway to go up to 15, and that would be um, regardless now, in the mayor's budget, um, they have the 7% increase that was applied. And one of the questions was, what does that do to the budget that the fair board has already presented? And my understanding is that if that budget passes, whatever is currently funded is likely to be funded through the subsidy. Um, and then as 
the property continues to improve and develop, the hope is that that subsidy will be reduced over time. Yeah, and uh, in other words, again, because I've been in the exact other side of this conversation, uh, if we were to vote anything over the 7% that has been proposed, assuming that the budget would pass at that rate, uh, say if we vote 10%, then that remainder would be coming from somewhere else within the fair, until you make up for it, revenue, exceed projection, uh, projections and whatnot. Just so to, that's what I meant by the recommended. It's to, to stay within that plus whatever council would do when they approve or not. And I guess my last question, Mr. Harley, then you can go. <laughs> uh, and when was the last time uh, Director Womack received a raise? Last year. And that was a percentage or was that a open range or was that a small percent? So I believe, and I just asked for confirmation, but I believe, and Commissioner Hendricks, you may remember this from last year. Um, last year was her first raise in five years. Um, so I, before this meeting, I thought Open Range was the new Yellowstone spinoff. <laughs> These people are waiting patiently for the meeting, Dan. I apologize for that. Uh, so the first thing I'll say is, uh, uh, Director Momak has spent her career in public service, so she's used to people discussing her salary openly at open meetings. So just want to point out that it's awkward. Thank you. It's awkward for all of us. We. So all I'm going to say is I think you do a good job. I'm going to be honest. I'm struggling to evaluate this decision because I don't have enough information to put this in the context. I don't know what basis we're coming from. I don't know any other person in Metro's salary. I'm struggling to be able to put this in context. I'm not saying I'm opposed or in favor. I just am struggling with the amount of information I have right now. I'll agree with that. It's a deficiency of the process of not having HR here to provide context to the board to give you exactly that, that comparison, right? Because you could say, well, you could go, uh, regardless of what the part of the decision that it's pertinent to specifically what happens here, you have to make the decision in a context of again metro and whatnot that's what also another comment say was well, a executive director not director because those can be very different i wonder if uh, and and not to re did i jump you i'm sorry oh, yeah. no, i was gonna say i read the email that mr smiley sent i've got it here guys so that's how i was able to get the information <laughs> <laughs> i didn't get an email how did you get an email okay um I, we have it pulled up here director's pay is a minimum of 106 for 30 19 the midpoint is 154 556 88 the maximum is 202 683 56 and Laura's current is 122. Uh, another contextual piece for us to make a better informed decision is also there you are considering Metro executive directors that are of all kinds of agencies and not necessarily the ones that are more uh, the, the type of, of, of productivity and revenue generating etc like right. this one right so if you compare with uh, and this two in particular are not considered within although they are Metro paid they're not considered in the same category would be some of the uh, downtown partnerships, uh, Music City Center, et cetera. Those are considerably higher than that, that, that cap, uh, one of them at least twice as high, right? So that's also to be uh, taken into consideration that if uh, this is personal opinion, it's also, I don't, I don't think that this is a typical agency per se, which uh, should follow a little bit more of a criteria, private sector type as the other two agencies do, or partnerships or whatever that's it's the proper name for this interestingly i'll add and then i'll call you mr harley um interestingly one of the biggest discussions that we've had in the metro council over the years every time we do a budget is exactly that and we need to be competitive with the private sector or we are going to continue to lose employees um you can look at metro legal and we hear that from them all the time and and so 
making sure that we retain the best and the brightest. Um, it's expensive to replace staff, as Laura can share. Um, it's expensive to hire. It's expensive to fire. It's expensive to try to find the right person. And so um, I just wanted to point that out, that the public-private comparator is, is important. Go ahead. Uh, I've seen the last two job announcements for staff come out, so I've kind of seen that salary range. Uh, what's the what's the highest paid employee you have? You know that their salary? Not not you. You can't count you. You can't count yourself. After you, I mean, I don't want to ask about what they mean. Citrice. I guess it's public information. You can keep it awkward. It's yeah. public. You want to say what it is? Christy, you'll have to make sure I'm, I'm right. She can write it down if you want to yeah. say it. I think it's 85. Is that right? I don't know what you make. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. All right. Um, Commissioner Hartley. I should also point out that. Uh, I work for a nonprofit, so you my my salary is also publicly available. You can check it out online, cmaworld.com. Uh, you know, I, I appreciate the ranges and where Laura falls in the range. And again, I think we should all reemphasize that uh, it's weird, and we are really appreciative of you, Laura, of taking this with a grain of salt and us asking the hard questions to make sure we're uh, in the trees, uh, that we're making sure we have diligence here. So just to make sure I understand, we have a 7% increase in the metro budget that could or could not be approved, but you know, if it's approved, that's 7% that will be increased in our subsidies. So our essentially our P&L stays flat to that. So the any additional incremental above that will be us making trying to make that money back up in our own P&L. Am I understanding that correctly? Okay, thank you. And is this is this a is this a motion that has to be passed today? And the reason I ask is I would like some information from Metro HR about where you know other increases at the director level are falling this year um, or is this something that we so the question is can we defer this or do we have to decide this today yeah. so this has to be something that's addressed before the budget is voted on by metro council metro council has to make their decision by the end of june because then it will trigger and so we have to make the decision today does that include the elements that we would that we would cover in the the fairgrounds budget? I'm sorry, I can hear in one ear at a time. Let me say it again. And I had my this year was busy, so would you mind? It's okay. Would you mind um, repeating that? The question is, I understand the the larger metro budget cycle. My question is, and apologies, not a metro employee, so I don't know everything about it. Is outside of the portion that Metro would fund in their budget, the part that would be covered by the fairgrounds budget, is that contingent on the overall Metro budget cycle? Yes. So basically you have to know the full number today. Yes. Now, the other thing that we can do, we can know the full number before they go to third reading. And I can check with the budget chair to find out when that third reading will be. And it could potentially call a special meeting to identify the amount of the open range that we would be able to share and then get the information from Director Hall at HR to find out exactly what that number looks like. Uh, yeah, one way of going about it would be we decided on a, on a number today, contingent on learning a little bit more of what everyone else is doing, and that would be pretty typical too. And uh, basically what you're looking at is council will vote on the final version of the budget. And because of that, that will give us an opportunity to amend what we originally thought based on what we think is going to pass or what we are informed is going to pass. So I think I understand the summary of that is we could make a directional statement today and then we could amend that with a special meeting later in the month. Is that correct? That is correct. I, I do want to put down, I'm sorry, Jasper, speak over you. I, I do want to put down, I don't know, we have a tendency, we have, we have gotten into a little bit of that. I, I don't like making decisions on immediacy. We, we did this with the parking increase. We're doing this with this increase. I don't like to make a decision on the immediacy with no information. I think that is not, that is 
and, and apologies for being upset about it, but I don't think that leads to good decision making. I think that leads to bad decision making. And I really think we need to be thinking further out. If this was the last day to decide this, we should have decided this two months ago. Uh, and you know, and I totally agree because uh, uh, when received an email from you know a constituent talking about this, I'm like, well, I'm looking through my email box and I'm like, I don't see an agenda. I don't know what he's talking about. Um, but I still read the information to try to figure out what was, you know, what was going to be coming up. So I don't, I don't agree either. But that's why I'm a little bit more knowledgeable now because I took that information and then start doing my own research and started, you know, digging deep into it. And so with that, I would like to, you know, maybe amend my, you know, offer an amendment to my motion or like the see, like I would like to throw out a number there and that would be at ten percent. So it'd be three on top of the seven that they. Uh, before seconding that, I, I think. To me, uh, to be strategic about this, there's two things that I think we need to try to accomplish here. One is completely unrelated to Laura as an individual performing today as the executive director is a point that was made just a few minutes ago is how do we strengthen this position to be competitive, period, regardless who's sitting in that chair, right? I think that that's so if, if it's a 10, a, an 8, a 10, a 12 percent, whatever it is, it's what what portion of the increase do we want to put a, without rationale behind it. The other one is considering the performance given the actual individual in the chair. I think that that that's the part that I think we can um, that I, I, I would suggest that we say, well, let, let's strengthen the, the role of the executive director as much as we can within the recommended parameters. And then the cherry on top of that, which I think can be the one driven by performance, because that that allows us to go to council even and say, hey, any chance you can amend the budget by a factor of X amount of dollars based on a gap that we will have in the budget if you approve it as proposed, right? So we say we need another 3% of Laura's salary uh, in, in the new budget uh, uh, approved by council or proposed by council. That, that will be a way of closing that gap without depending on revenue, right? So it's my, in, in other words, my suggestion would be let's do let's cover as much as we can right now and then we can try to work on on getting more on, on filling up the gap right instead of being too conservative right now and say well let's go seven percent because if it doesn't pass at nine percent we won't be able to do more and and uh, the portion of the salary versus the productivity of the uh, entire place is also not shouldn't be a concern if it's one or two points uh, also just a math comment and, and I'm going to throw something out there. If you remember, Commissioner Hendricks, and, and I'll just share with you all, we didn't try to close the gap last year. We improved substantially so that it was more fair. Um, but we knew that over time, we would have the opportunity to close that gap. And so I, I'm like you. I believe that being a little bit conservative on it, and um, making sure that we are appropriate given the position. Um, I would be happy to get in touch with um, Shannon at HR and ask her about the comparatives to comparable public sector positions, as well as other department heads in Metro, and then be able to circulate that to y'all. And then uh, Commission, uh, Director Womack can tell me whether we need to schedule a meeting. And you'll be the one to send that information out because I can't do it. Could, could Shannon also do uh, comparable positions uh, around the country as outside of Nashville? Because she, she may be, he or she, I don't know, could they do that? I can ask her. Yeah. Okay. Uh, allegedly, they do that before they put out their recommendation for the actual budget proposal. So technically, the 7% already comes with a comparative analysis. Of course, have, having to understand the current economic situation just throughout the entire country, that is, and read between the lines politically, that's covering for inflation, and that's it. And then they put the hot potatoes on us. Now, how much higher than inflation do we want to go? Which I think we should provision for some but knowing that we have an opportunity to actually go more if we need to try to approve that, it will hardly be less. And even if it's not approved at the rate that we have, this is it's one item in the budget. It's not 
trying to move the entire budget to 10% increase and we only have seven on site, right? Again, that's what I meant. This is a marginal change compared with everything. If we cannot get council to help us with that little uh, extra in the budget. Uh, Commissioner Hartley, to your point about information and I hear you, we, um, I think I forget that we have so many new members on the board because we, ex we had an extensive review of just what you all are now asking for last year. Um, engaged HR, did the evaluation, got feedback from the HR director. So that all that information was compiled and processed last year. Um, and then as part of it, you know, I had never gotten a performance evaluation in six years. So the fair board amended the bylaws last year to make sure that the fair board chair would give my performance, you know, that was something that would happen with the fair board chair and myself, which has occurred. So we kind of put that process and documented it in the bylaws. So that is part of the process. Commissioner Hartley. I'm gonna say every time how much I appreciate Laura Womack and how I text her all the time with lots of questions. So never doubt that. Um, I appreciate that. That's good, but I don't have any of that information and neither does Anthony and there's Diego. And I mean, we don't have that information. So I'm, I'm in favor of competitively paying our staff. Absolutely in favor of that. Um, but I'm also hesitant to approve a large salary increase for our top employee without more context. Um, that's not something I want to do. I would, I'm going to say this is a weird thing. I think there's a good chance this is going to pass. So we should probably just move forward. I'm just saying I'm not happy with not having the information to make a sound financial decision. I don't think that's good governance. No, what I'm saying is I agree with you. I'm going to do better at getting, making sure that you guys have more information than you could ever need knowing that we do have new board members that was my point is i hear you and and i will provide you with better information yeah i will say that this discussion and other boards and commissions that i have represented um, has always been an uncomfortable one for the executive director and um, uh, their normal staff role of providing you with all the information you could possibly ever want and more um, may feel a little in conflict with their desire to leave it entirely to your discretion. So at this point, Commissioner Hendricks, do you want to amend your motion? Or do you want to specify a percentage knowing that I can? I would like to amend my motion to add two things. One, a conditional 10% increase. And then the second part will be to come back and discuss before the end of the month, a special call meeting before the end of the month. Sherry, can I just clarify that? Based on the information that we're going to receive. So then when we think, so when we come back at the special meeting, we have more information that we can say, oh no, we can't do 10%. We can do this. Or instead of doing 10%, let's do 15%. Because this is what this is the information that we receive. So it sounds like, and, and I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm just making sure I understand. It's it's 10%, we get the information, we come back together, and we if we want to make a change, we do. Okay. Correct. Yes. But are we allowed to go? We couldn't go under if we say 10% now, could we? We can do anything above zero, so we can go up or down. So we say, so if 10% was to be agreed upon today, we could go down if we, after getting further information? Yeah. Uh, may I suggest one little uh, tweak to that would be to uh, have a condition to do the 7% that is recommended, that decide on that now and then put a, a placeholder, let's call it about 3% and contingent on those and that information when it comes, we say is 3% enough? Is it too much? Is it too little based on other comparisons? But go with the 7% that we already know comes as part of the overall proposal, right? So I'd say we're guaranteeing a 7% increase, 
putting a placeholder of three points on top of that, those three points are the ones that are contingent, not the whole 10%. I accept your friendly amendment. Then I second. Is that is that the process? Yes. Then I second. Okay. Is there any discussion on the amended proposal? Do you want me to read Say it, it one more time. Okay. Please. So we are going to affirm an open range increase for Laura in the amount of 7% with an additional conditional increase of 3% with the opportunity to have a specially called meeting once I have gotten in touch with Director Hall at HR for a study of the comparatives to public sector and to other department heads as well as a local and national review. And then I will provide that information to Director Womack who will then provide it to y'all. And then um, you will give feedback to Director Womack as to whether or not you want to call another, want me to call another meeting, okay? So that sounds like, and two questions. One, this is probably for Citrice, 7% in the mayor's budget. So the, the mayor is saying he would like all Metro employees to receive a 7% increase. Is that your understanding of that? Yes, fall range. Well, Diego shook his head no, so I'm gonna. Oh. Oh. Not everyone is eligible for the same combination, so the difference will be in semantics. Oh, but percentage. The percentage of total increase of compensation, yes. The names for their different compensation uh, parts of the compensation package are not the same. So it's not open range, but yes to 7%. Okay, thank you. And the second part, point is, are, are you expecting us to indicate if we want to have a special set, special meeting after receiving the information, and if no one indicates they want to have a special meeting, then the 3% that is contingent will become firm. Is that correct? Correct. Any further discussion, Commissioner Owens? And if the special meeting is to concur, does it have to be in person? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, but yes, the Open Meetings Act does require that all meetings at which you take a vote be in person. Commissioner Hartley. One more. And yes. When, when would the salary change if approved? When will it take place? July 1. Any other questions? Any other comments? We, sh we should have did this in March. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to call for the vote. Commissioner Owen. Uh, one before my vote, please include your evaluation in there so we can see that as well. She said this evaluation has been done, so please include that with the information. So, yes. Commissioner Hartley. I'm going to sound like a terrible person. I am going to abstain. I don't believe I have enough information to do it today. It's again, I think Laura is amazing. I think we have failed ourselves by not providing information in advance, and I don't think Again, raising the, the salary on, on this amount of information is, is not something I want to do. Commissioner Hendricks. Aye. Commissioner Quarte. Um, I and uh, because I'm very comfortable with the contingencies being there and because there is a performance component that it's undeniable. I think that, that that's the part that makes me feel comfortable. I do agree that we need to have more information. Mm -hmm. If we do it too early in the process, we wouldn't have the 7% that we do have as a, as a suggestion. So there's a balance there in the calendar that uh, Metro doesn't make it very easy to, uh, to make informed decisions, generally speaking. That's my personal opinion, not as a commissioner of anything, but I. And I am an I. Motion passes, and I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a second? Second. I'm assuming we need no discussion. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you for being here. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network.
If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.